Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. That was great. Ah, welcome. Welcome. Glad to have you all with us today. I'm, as we uh, get, get uh, started this morning, I want to pray for us. But I, I know, I, I think about this. I mean, I think a lot of us may, may feel this way. You may feel one or two couple of categories. How many in here feel like you're just trying to make it? You know, I mean, I think a lot of us, a lot of days, a lot of weeks, a lot of time, we're just trying to make it. And so we're glad you made it here. All right. And then, uh, and for others, maybe we have, we have more questions than we got answers. I think that's really probably most of us right there. We have more questions than we have answers. And, and um, the good news is I believe this book gives us all of those answers. And, uh, I, well, I, I think I know it does. So, uh, but I want to pray for us as we, we dive in this morning. Father, we love you and we thank you together. We can come together in your name, Jesus. And we think we can come together looking at what your word says to us. And as you draw men and women, boys and girls to you. And I pray, God, for this morning as we meet together that uh, we won't have distractions uh, things that are going on in our lives that just distract us or even in here, Lord. I pray we'll not be sure. We'll hear the word. We'll hear what you have to say to us and that we'll respond to that. Um, <clears throat> in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Tastes like chicken. Uh, yeah. So... I was just trying to decide if I should say this or not, but it tastes like chicken. So, so uh, I was struck by this. Uh, you just can't hang out with me. I get, you know, ser- pastors get their sermon illustrations all over the place. Just going out to eat. But uh, Teresa and I went with some friends to eat the other day, and and uh, she got probably the worst chicken ever. You know, it just wasn't any. It wasn't bad, sick kind of. It just was like you know, let you say, hey, y'all, y'all can have it. And, we're just, we're good. And, and so I, a few days later, I'm like, man, I was feeling so bad. I got to get her something, you know, to eat. She, you know, and, and some grilled chicken like she likes it. So I went someplace and they had what was called Key West chicken. That's what it was. So uh, I asked her after she ate, I said, well, how was your, how was your chicken? She said, it tastes like chicken. That sounds funny to us, right? But, but in this day and time, I mean, it's not always the case, is it, right? I mean, whether it's the truth of what I'm hearing out here in the media or here or anywhere else, I just got down to where a piece of chicken doesn't even taste like chicken. I'm not sure if it's chicken, you know? I mean, I mean, when the truth is not even in our food anymore, which I know a lot of y'all got more to say about that, but I'm just saying... <clears throat> I mean, what in the world can we trust? I mean, used to, you cooked a piece of chicken and it tasted like chicken, right? I'm just saying, I'm just saying, it just, you know, but when she said that to me, she said, it tastes like chicken. I thought, why would you even have to say that? <laughs> well, what is this world? How, how far has this world gone down the tubes that a bird doesn't even taste like it used to taste? <clears throat> I actually Googled yesterday, you know, why does it taste... Like chicken, of course, you know, that's dangerous, right? Oh, I'm like, okay, sorry I asked. <laughs> hey, I, we have people here with the first, the first time. I'm sl- glad you haven't left yet. So um, <laughs> thanks for coming. We are currently going through the gospel. John, right now, we're, we're past, I'd say, the midway point. And uh, we're going to be in John chapter 4 today. A lot of these songs that we just sang about are absolutely about what we're going to talk about. And it's going to be, uh, it's several weeks we got left, but it's pretty much within a 24-hour period now at this point. So each week as we talk about it, it's like, this is like the next setting. This is not like weeks later, months later, or a year or two later. So so last week, so it's good to listen to the <coughs> previous see where we're at. But as, uh, we'll, we'll see that as, as Jesus is he's troubled in spirit. He's troubled in spirit because he knows what looms ahead. He knows he's about to go to the cross. I mean, if you knew, you know, within 24 hours or whatever, it's, you know, that would weigh heavily on you. So he's, he's, he's troubled in spirit. And, and the disciples don't know exactly, but I bet they, they're not liking the way that Jesus is starting to talk, you know. 
Um, surely they could see in his body language that he was visibly troubled. I, I suspect that Jesus was not one to hide his feelings. So he has told them that he's about to go away and they can't go with him. In fact, he told them that things are about to get so bad that Peter, the rock, the man, the myth and the legend, as they say, Peter will deny him three times before the night's even over. I mean, what universe could they, they got to be thinking, what universe are we in that Peter, within the next several hours, is going to deny even knowing Jesus three times? So they, I mean, they're like, they've got to, they got to be like, whoa, man, this is super bad. So we read in the John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, and Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Those are some good words for all of us, are they not? Maybe you came in here today with some stuff. Jesus says, and that's for you, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. You see, your heart not being troubled has to do with who you believe in. Let me tell you, if you're believing in this world, just pretend you didn't read, let not your heart be troubled. He says, let not your heart be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way to where I'm going. Oh, for me, the words of Jesus scream, trust me. Trust me. Somebody today needs to hear that. You're going through some stuff. Just Jesus says, trust me. It's time to believe. You see, Jesus, he knows their hearts. He knows the situation. It's all over but the crime. I mean, it's some time to be for he's about to be on the cross, but let's say it. He, he, he knows it's done. And he knows what they're feeling. They're starting to sense the gloom and doom that he's, that he's you know, that, 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 that is coming. And even these words added to the previous conversations likely are, are, are making their hearts troubled. The very words that Jesus is saying are like, you're leaving? What's going on? I mean, this is troubling their hearts. So he says, let not your hearts be troubled. They need hope. He knew that they needed hope. And so Jesus says that again. Let not your hearts be troubled. Listen, when stuff hits the fan in the next several hours, it is going to feel like the sky is falling in on them. I mean, they, they, were, they were happy campers. They've been camping with Jesus, hanging out with Jesus, having a good old time. But, but life is about to get real hard. And when Jesus is out of the picture, that's, that's not even a world they want to imagine. Think about us. Could you imagine a world, if you're a believer, a world without Jesus? I don't even want to imagine that, right? Because the world is dark, and he's already told us that he's the light of the world, then we would just stay in darkness. I mean, so what do you do when the sky has fallen in? What do you do when you're having that week? And, I, and I've talked to several of you, and you've had those weeks where, bam, it happened. Bam, it's like back to back to back, bad stuff happening. You know, you're thinking, well, this happened. Well, at least I got this. And then you go, you get a phone. Oh, no, th that too? And then you're like, well, at least I got, and then the boom, that too? I mean, it's like sometimes in life, don't we kind of look around like, what is this? Is, it's a joke, right? So what do you do when the sky is falling in? Jesus, Jesus tells them, and it's good for us to hear, believe in God, believe also in me. That song we sang Standing in your faithfulness. I don't know if you get that. Or, I, know, I, mean, I get that. 
I'm standing here in his faithfulness, not mine. My faithfulness is, you know, I don't know about y'all, I got good days and bad days. But I'm sta- I can stand in his faithfulness. He said, believe in God, believe also me. And once again, Jesus and the Father are one. He fi- Jesus finds multiple ways to say this. And then he extends hope. And he tells them about a big, big house. His, his father's house has many rooms. He has, he has room for everybody. He says, in my father's house are many places to dwell. There's, there's plenty of room. And Jesus has called them to believe in God. And, and now he gives them the specifics to believe about his father, which is meant to put them at ease. It, it's, like, it's like this conversation. Jesus is giving them an injection of calm that they're going to need in the next 24 hours, in the next 30 years, and today. But Jesus puts that calm into them, and I'd say into us. The trouble that they experience is real, but it is temporary. But trouble is temporary. This world is as bad as it gets for a Christian and as good as it gets for an unbeliever. Heaven is forever. This world is not. Our focus, your focus, my focus, and let's got to be honest, we had things this week that we were focused in the wrong place. Our focus is everything. Do we focus on the temporary problems of today or eternal life? Jesus, I like what one commentator said. He said it this way. Jesus sought to give them heart-strengthening vertical vision as the cure for their troubling horizontal vision. When life is beating you up, look up. Set your mind on things above. We're not of this world. And back to Jesus' words, he says, he said, if that weren't true, would I have told you that I was going to prepare a place for you? And Jesus said, would I lie to you about that? How many of you think Jesus lies? I almost raised my hand. How many of y'all leave? He, he answered, he says, you're going you're gonna to be with me. And being with Jesus is what it's all about. See, heaven is nothing without Jesus. Being with Jesus is what it is all about. It's it's the same warm, fuzzy feeling that Moses got about God going with them, continuing with the Israelites to the promised land. I don't know if you remember that in Exodus 30, 33, somewhere in there, the, the Jews, the Israelites were like, yeah, well, God told them, look, I ain't going with y'all anymore. He's like, if I do, I may kill every one of you. So, hey, you know what? It's better off. I'm just going to send an angel and he'll y'all, get y'all on in there. I promised that I was going to get you there, but I ain't going. And Moses said, well, if you ain't going, I don't want to go. And God's like, all right. Moses found out that all he needed, all any of us need is to God be with us. This is what Jesus is saying. And he adds, he adds, you know the way to where I'm going. Now that, that last statement there prompted a question in verse five. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And I got to tell y'all, I, I like defending Thomas. In my opinion, he is erroneously labeled doubting Thomas for seemingly lack of belief of an occasion that we'll get to later. But Thomas asked the, quest, the questions everyone else wanted to ask. You know, you've been in class at school and the teacher has laid out everything profoundly 
whether it's on the board or lecture, or PowerPoint, whatever, they've laid it all out, and then goes, are there any questions? And you're like, I ain't got no idea what you just talk about. I mean, you're thinking, I would ask a question, but I didn't understand enough to ask a question, right? And so nobody's going to ask a question. But then there's that, all, there's that one person in the class. It's that person that everybody makes fun of that, is no, that has no self-awareness, that they'll ask anything. And that person asks a question that everybody else would ask. And you're like, and I'm just going to tell you right now, thank God for that, those people like that. Because they ask the question. And Thomas, he just, he just asked the question. Now, maybe that's you spiritually. Maybe you've got quite, maybe, maybe you've been coming for a while and you've not yet stepped in what you said. You've, you're a true believer. You're really following Jesus. You know what next steps to take. And, and I want to say to you, this morning. Here I got I, the, the dear ladies that came up at the beginning. In our bulletin, there's, there's this thing. It's got a connect card. And on the back, it's got, it's got a place where you can ask questions. Now, I'm being dead serious. Y'all hold these up. Look, wave them at me. All right, good. Very good. A bunch of you got them. All right, okay. Now, I'm being totally serious because I know, look, I, I'm old. I'm getting it. I get it. I know. I get in the room. I say, man, there are these old people. I'm like, I'm old. I'm old. Okay. So I've, I've been in the Bible for over half a century. <clears throat> and that doesn't mean I know everything. Okay. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that I've dealt with some questions that there aren't questions for me anymore. And you may have, I don't even know the questions that people might be asking today about God, the Bible, Jesus. I, I don't know what the questions are. I have no questions. I mean, not serious questions of any. I mean, there's things I don't completely understand, but I know enough to go, eh, you know, it's not, that's not for me to know. So I want you to take that bulletin and don't be embarrassed about anybody around you. Be that self-unaware person that doesn't care what anybody thinks. And write your questions about Jesus, salvation, heaven, hell, whatever it is. Put it on there and put your info on there so that we can contact you. And by the way, give a real contact information. And then when we do contact you, actually answer the call or whatever, respond to us, okay? Because I know how it is. You're feeling really in here. You're like, oh, I need to do that. I need to ask. And then on Monday or Tuesday, if we were to check with you, you're like, yeah. no, man, we want to help you. Just nod if you get it. Uh, use that Connect card. And let's sit down and talk about it. I don't want, any, I don't want anybody not making it to the right place in the end because they had a, what they thought was a dumb question. There are no dumb questions, after, even after I said a minute ago, all right? Listen, if you have a question, someone else likely has the same question. So Thomas says, and I paraphrase, Thomas says, Lord, we don't have a clue of where you're going, so how can we know the way? What are you talking about? Help, we are lost. And we read that leads into the great verse, verse 6, and then verse 7. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. I love this about Jesus. Jesus answers our questions. You got questions. He's got answers. We see it over and over again in the Gospel of John. It's almost like he couldn't wait for Thomas to ask that. It's like he set him up. And Jesus gives him what's my personal favorite of the I am statements. There's seven that John gives. This is number six. And we find that Jesus is both inclusive and exclusive. And I'm not talking about the way the world has abused those words of inclusive and exclusive. This world that we live in could ruin a rainbow, I'm just saying. And we find, and we find that Jesus, again, is he's both inclusive and exclusive. He's the only way to the Father. That's exclusive. He's the only way to the Father. That's exclusive. But earlier in John's gospel, he says that whosoever believes in him will have eternal life. That's inclusive. 
He's the only way to salvation. The world that we live in tries to say that there are many ways to God, many religions, and Jesus says that that is not so. I read this week, and I'm not going to give credence to that. I know it's true, but I, I read something that said the Pope said that there's many ways, these other guys, all that. I, I'm, I'm not even, I don't even know if what I read on the internet is correct, okay? So I'm not going to get trolled by that because he may not have said that. But if he did say that, he's wrong. According to Jesus. Salvation is not through a philosophy, good works, or a religious teaching, but through a person. Jesus Christ is that person. Listen, I'm not narrow-minded. Jesus is. Jesus is the way because he is the door of entry. He is the way. He's the way we enter into the abundant life. In John 10, Jesus is the narrow gate that leads to life. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. And Jesus is the way because his death on the cross paved the way for access to God. As Paul writes in Romans 5, I'm going to just read verse 2. It says, through him, through Jesus, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. I just got to tell y'all, this, this verse, John 14, 6, I appreciate it so much that, God, that Jesus said there's one way. Because I've been to places, people have given me directions, and I've gotten lost. And I'm like, just tell me the way. Don't tell, just, can it be just one way, not multiple ways, you know? And I'm glad he said that. But in, but in Romans 5, Two, we, he says, we have obtained our introduction, our access. Uh, the Greek word means, means uh, our means of admission into the presence of a person in high position. He is the only way. No one comes to the Father except through me, is what Jesus said. Jesus, uh, let, let me stop, stop before I read that next thing. This I know we live in a world where everybody wants us to pander and give in and suck up to whatever the world says, but that's baloney. It's not true. Would you, want me to t would you want me to lie to you to make you feel good? And then at the end, you're like, oh, why didn't you just tell me the truth? Jesus is the truth in person. Physically, he was the truth. In person. I mean, I mean, truth walked into the room when Jesus walked in. This is so important and so relative to life discussion today. It is painfully obviously that we do not get complete truth from media outlets or whatever or where we get information today. So whether the world recognizes it or not, it is Jesus that they seek for he is truth personified. Let me go back over that. That was a lot, mouthful. The world that we live in is seeking the truth, okay? Jesus is the truth. So the world that we live in, they don't know it, but Jesus is who they're seeking. And who knows Jesus? Followers of Jesus know the truth. So the world that you live in, he has teed it up. He's got the tee there. He set the ball on the tee for you and me to share the truth with everybody out there because we have what they want in Jesus. You get that? Jesus is the final reality in contrast with the shadows of truth which preceded him. But in the present context, the term truth seems to have a different shade of meaning. It is that, it is that which stands over and against the lie. Jesus is the truth because he is the dependable source of redemptive revelation. He is the truth on how to be saved. That's what that fancy sentence meant. He's the truth on how to be saved. 
these people, and we want to know God, and Christ reveals the Father. But just as the way is a living way, so also the truth is living truth. It is active. It takes hold of us, and it moves us powerfully. It sanctifies us, it guides us, and it sets us free. Basically, not it, but he is the truth. He himself in person, the life. And Jesus is not referring here, referring here to the breath or spirit, pneuma, which brings out our body to life. He is not thinking of the soul or the psyche, nor of life as outwardly manifested bios, but of life as the opposed to death, zoe. Life is in him, as he said earlier in John 5, 26. Jesus, Jesus said, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. Listen, Jesus is the source and giver of life for his own. He has the light of life, John 8, 12, the words of life, John 6, 68, and he came that we might have life and have it more abundantly, John 10, 10. And just as death is separation from God, so life indicates communion with God. Now, all three concepts, the way, the truth, the life, are active and dynamic. The way brings people to God the truth sets men free, and the life produces communion with God. Let that sink in. And Jesus, he finishes the thought with, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know me, you do know him, and have seen him. Those that know Jesus know God the Father. There is nothing else to know about God for these disciples. They have been exposed to the truth. They have met the truth. They know the truth. If you know Jesus, you've met him, you know him. There's nothing else that you really don't know. You know him. You know that you know I mean, yeah, there's some things out there, the God stuff, we, yeah, but you know, you know them. So be, be attentive as we're going through, the, as we're finishing the gospel. Be attentive. Think every word out of Jesus' mouth to the end might be his last. So they're very important. And right now, it's like, as Jesus is talking to them, it's like the, the fire hiders they're open and they're, they're drinking out of the, you know, they're drinking out of the fire hose, right? It's just coming so hard. This is stuff that they need to download, and they'll come back to it later. It's, it's a lot to take in, but it is what they need to know to live a life of perseverance. And isn't that the thing for us, Christian? I don't know if you, I know for me, perseverance, finishing strong, making it to the end, right? That's the hard part. Believing about Jesus, that, that's, you know, it's, you can read the Bible and see how he fits all the prophecies. Knowing who he is, that's the easy part. It's me persevering through all that. When things coming at me and me still standing in him, that's, that's what it takes. That's where I need the help. Because life will throw things at us that cause us to question both God and God's will. You've done it. Why does that happen to me? Or why did that happen to them, but it didn't happen to them? We do it. We, we, things are going to happen in life that we question God or God's will. So Jesus is trying to prepare them and redirect their attention to the eternal, not the temporary. Let me just break this down to y'all. Y'all know we're all in here. We're not, we're not going to live forever on this planet. To many of us would say, thank you, God. Yes. Right? But we're not really necessarily wanting to go today. But just saying, that's the thing. Right? Only the life after this, only eternity lasts. I don't know how many of y'all watched The Matrix. I did. I mean, I'm not a big, ooh, watched a bunch of movies, stuff. I know there was probably Matrix 1, 2, 3. I, I don't know. I just know about the green pill, red pill. Is that right? 
Okay, thanks. Thanks for that one nod. Okay, you know. But we try to figure out, you know, you watch the movie, you're like, well, wait, was that real or was that real? Yeah, that's all I remember about it besides the <laughs> catching the bullet stuff. Yeah, that's pretty cool. But Jesus is clarifying to them what is real. He says, look, a bunch of stuff's about to happen. Keep looking up. Keep looking up, right? It's don't, don't get hung up down here, the horizontal. Let the vertical take hold. And I love that Jesus removes all doubt by answering these questions. Verse 8 and 9, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still don't know who me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? So Thomas, earlier, asked the question everybody in the class wanted to know, right? Everybody wanted to ask that. And Jesus, he answers that and then some. Now, Philip follows up with what I'm going to call a dumb question. Now, I know teachers in here say, there's no dumb question. I'll agree with that. Really, There's no such thing as a dumb question. But I'm going to call this a dumb question anyway. I'll tell you why. And, and by the way, nobody wants to be that person to ask the dumb question, right? You're sitting in class and, uh, God, that's embarrassing. But it's exactly, the, the statement is exactly what Jesus said in verse 7. So he answers even stronger and plainer. He says, he, he says, You've seen me, you've seen the Father. So here's my, my justification of calling it a dumb question. Jesus said, how can you ask that? That's a nice way of saying, that's a dumb question. <laughs> how can you say that? How can you say, show us the Father? That's what I've been saying. I and the Father are one. What, what do you think that means? And don't miss this. These, these questions that they ask are all for the generations like us that follow. One might say, had I been there, I'd have got, got clarification by asking whatever. And these people asked those questions. And they were the people that knew Jesus best. They were hanging around with him. They lived with him. And they still had these questions. So thank God that they did it and they're for us. I mean, let me ask you this more. Do you have trouble understanding the Trinity? I mean, I've explained the Trinity to me people many times, and I'm still not sure I understand it. But here I'm gonna help you, I'm gonna help all of us feel better. The disciples didn't understand the two. <laughs> I and the Father are one. They're like, oh, what are you saying? You get that? Now, we'll be getting to number three, but Jesus is trying to get them to two, <laughs> okay? So if, if you have trouble understanding some things, just know that these guys live with Jesus and breathe with Jesus, and they're like asking some questions that he, that I'm going to just go ahead and say, he's done questions, but anyway, whatever, okay. Verses 10 and 11 says, do you not believe that I am, in the Father, and the Father is in me. The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or, you know what? Just believe the works. Believe the works. This is good. Maybe this will help us. This, what I'm about to say, this is, this was, this was really good for me, so I, uh, in my notes, it's written in red, and it's not up there. So I'm just going to tell you, this is, this is good. It says, Jesus did not ask if they understood. Jesus did not ask if they understood that I am the Father or one. Rather, he asked if they believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Did you, did you get that? God's not asking you if you understand. He's asking you if you believe. I got more sermon here, but for me, that's, you know? 
See, following Jesus comes down to faith. You want to be that person that knows everything? Good luck with that. And the good thing is God doesn't say you have to understand it all. See, it's certainly not a blind faith, but there are things our finite mind cannot completely understand about God. So Jesus calls for belief, not complete understanding. Praise the Lord. So picture Jesus holding his hands out to you over the water, calling you out of the boat, saying, trust me. Just have that in the back of your mind. But I mean, you've been doing life all this time on your own. And I'm going to ask, how's that working out? There are things that you still don't completely understand about God. And so you're hesitant to trust him. Yet he has shown you enough and the world that you have trusted thus far is devoid of understanding and proven again and again untrustworthy. Can you trust the world? No. Those who believe in him will have eternal life. Who or what are you trusting is my question. If you want, listen, if you want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. You got to trust them. So I repeat that. Jesus calls for belief, not complete understanding. Yet he, sends, yet he sends help, help for us to believe. The very works are unexplainable. The, the resurrection of Lazarus, the, the very works were unexplainable, yet undeniable. Those are supposed to be enough. He charged them. He said, you know what? Oh, I'm trying to explain this to you guys. He says, you know, just believe the works. Just believe what you saw. Trust what you saw, what you've heard. Trust that. You know, I, I'm just, you, I, just, just the works. They testify that I and the Father are one. Verses 12 through 14 we read, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I'll do it. Now, it gets a little extra as he talks to the disciples and he, he, he does one of those truly, truly, or amen, amen things. This, is, this declaration places great emphasis on the truth of what he is about to say, which calls for careful attention. So whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. In this passage, Jesus ties together believing with doing. Head knowledge to the facts about Jesus will not save anyone. It's not a matter of intellect. Heart belief is required for the assurance of salvation, Romans 10, 9, and 10. As we said last week, God looks at the heart. He knows the heart. And as James says, faith without works is dead. It's not a real faith, James 2, 17. We aren't considered true believers because of our works, but works will follow true believers. In the book of Acts, the apostles did do many works, Many of the works that Jesus did, even raising the dead on one occasion, at least, they, these, these works were a testimony of the one in whom they believed. It was proof of the one they followed and gave their lives for. When reading, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, ought to cause us to ask a question. How can the disciples of Jesus do greater works, and does this include us? Today, what will happen after Jesus goes to the Father? Now, that's getting ahead, we know, but he, we'll see that he will send the Holy Spirit to indwell believers, and they will have supernatural power to carry out works. How would they be greater? Well, believers can share the gospel in places Jesus did not, and they can go to the Gentiles while Jesus primarily to the Jews. Right there. And, and there was only one Jesus while there are multitudes of believers who, can, who together can go do greater works. This is why we're to be making disciples that make disciples. Keep the thing going. 
That's how we do greater works. That is the greater works ministry. We are to reproduce so that more of us are going and reaching as many people as we can with the gospel. It is the gospel message that saves people for eternal life. We got to get this word out. The Holy Spirit empowered miracles done by the New Testament disciples have forever left an impression for us to read about. The story and life of Jesus was validated, confirmed, and affirmed in them. Jesus' works were limited by time and space, but that is not the case in the works of the disciples. So numerically, they are naturally greater. Jesus sent them to more places and more people than he ever physically went to. The power to perform these greater works would only be available because Jesus was going to the Father. You see, Jesus had to leave for them to get this done. It was only then that he would send the Holy Spirit, as we'll talk about soon, to indwell believers and empower them for ministry. Christ's promise to send the Holy Spirit offered further comfort to the disciples. They needed then, and we, we need today, the Holy Spirit to empower and encourage us to go and to keep on going. I, I bet there's a lot of people in here, you have gone, but you stopped going. Why? You need the Holy Spirit to help you keep on going. Maybe today somebody needs to hear, like, you know, I, I need to get back up and get going again. It's, it's a trap we all fall into. It's easy. It's hard. It's hard work if we're doing it in the natural man. But if we're doing it in the spirit, we can do it. Sadly, Jesus would not be physically with them to continue the mission of reaching the world with the gospel, but as we will soon find out, he will send the Holy Spirit to reside in them to finish the work. <clears throat> and it's greater things. There, there's nothing greater than leading a person to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. We can, and we can only do greater by extending that. That is getting more people out there, leading more people to Jesus Christ. And as I have seen, it takes more. You know what? I've seen, I've seen more people work harder to get the vote, get people to go out to vote than share the gospel. Sorry, not sorry if that hurts feelings. And as I've seen, it takes more than one person to reach another person to Christ. You notice that? I mean, I've had people that I've shared the gospel with many times, many different ways, and then one other person comes around and they share it one time and they get saved. I'm like, okay, all right. I mean, it just, it, it does. We need all of us, Amen. I mean, I'm grateful that another person went and what I said, and even might have been the same thing, it may I'm just like, okay, great, amen. We got to go. Listen, Jesus is calling us to go. Trust him as the way, the truth, and the life. Trust him as you go. This is how you and I as disciples of Christ will do greater things. So in context, Jesus is showing the disciples the way to salvation and that they will be part of reaching the world. So ask, and then he says, so this, this phrase, this is sentence. This, so he says, ask me anything in my name and I'll do it. It has to do with that context, going and reaching people with the gospel. This is not about the pastor getting the Learjet. It's not about I want a Cadillac, pray hard to get the Cadillac. You weren't praying hard enough. This is not about any of that stuff. Asking in the name of Jesus Christ is not a gene in a bottle which guarantees one will receive what they ask for. He's not talking about it. Read it in the context it's in. Clearly, the asking must be done in the spirit. We are to pray according to God's will, seeking his glory. God always answers prayer, but it's according to his sovereign pleasure. He may answer yes, no, or wait. Sometimes no is the best answer. We, last week, I forgot who was up here. might have been Taylor or somebody said, at the beginning of the service said, uh, you know, talking about praying. But what if God answered every pray, prayer you said yes this week? And when they said that, I'm like, ooh, I don't know. There's probably something you should have said no to, right? Got me to think. But sometimes he says, no, he knows best. And you know what I do? I trust him in that. Father knows best. Let not your heart be troubled. Trust me. I got this. How many of you believe that? Let not your heart be troubled. Trust me. 
I know, I know it looks bad. I know it looks bleak. I know you wouldn't have done it that way. But Jesus says, trust me, I got it. That's the way to live life. Things are about to get dicey here in our story. They're going to need hope. They're going to need to trust Jesus. And all of his words need to be in their minds for replay on demand later. All the things he's saying now, it doesn't make all that sense to him in that moment. But it's going to when it needs to. That's, the, that's why you read the Bible. It may not make sense right then for what you need. But later, you're like, oh, I see. That was in John. He's talking about that. See, that's why you memorize scripture. It comes up when you need it. The greatest thing I've ever done is trust Jesus. That's, that's not baloney. That's not a pastor preaching. The greatest thing I've ever done is trust Jesus. Now is your time, decision time for you. Some here, some here need to just simply trust Jesus. You saw people got baptized last week. They just simply trusted Jesus and they're following through in that. And for others here, I'm going to ask, who are you raising up that will do greater things? Are you discipling anybody? You see, this is how the greater things ministry is passed on. The gospel comes to me. I turn, I take it to them and tell them, hey, take it. And they take it. And they take it. Will your, this is important, will your Jesus story die with you? Now that is sad. So I'm going to ask you, if you're going to heaven, if you're going to live with Jesus forever, who are you bringing? Who are you bringing? I invite you to stand and you do business, you do business with God. Maybe it's writing down a question. You're like, oh, I got a question. Maybe it's to come up here and pray for others. Maybe it's to pray for yourself. Whatever that might be. But as the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now about something, hey, I need to do this or do that, then you should do that.